Hello, and welcome to Nothing But Dicta, the podcast where nothing is binding and everyone has an opinion. I'm your host today, Nina Burris. My guest is Scott Pagel, director of the Burns Law Library here at GW and the first law librarian we've had on the show so far. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm so excited that you're here to tell our listeners all about one of the most interesting collections of manuscripts housed in GW Special Collections. I'm excited to learn about them too. So what have you brought for us today? Well, this is a 12 volume set that is important for many reasons. It's tied to the history of law in America and it's tied to the history of GW Law School. Let me start by telling you a little bit about the history of the set. Well, I'll start in the middle of the story with Helen Newman, who was the law librarian here in the 1920s. She graduated from GW in 1925, and actually that was the year if we moved into this building in Stockton Hall. The whole law library fit into the fourth floor of Stockton Hall at the time. She got her LLB in 1925 and her LLM in 1927, and she started as the assistant law librarian and eventually became law librarian. When she was a student here, she noticed some books on the shelves and they were just in the treatise section. At that time, all the treatises, there weren't many, were shelved alphabetically by author. And she noticed these in the C section. And just 12 lines of manuscripts, she didn't know what they were. It said, Mr. Carroll's Notebooks. She thought they were interesting. And then when she was librarian, she began digging into the history of GW. And she learned about William Thomas Carroll, who was the first law faculty member here at GW. And she made the connection And she pulled these immediately off the shelves when she discovered what they were. What she had found were the Litchfield notebooks of William Thomas Carroll. And those are today the most valuable books in our collection because not only of what they are, but because of their connection to GW. Most histories about GW say that law school began here in 1865. Actually, law classes were taught here much earlier. The Board of Trustees authorized funds to begin law classes in 1826, and they hired two lawyers, William Cranch and William Thomas Carroll, as the first two faculty members. Now, William Cranch was the major name. He was the nephew of John Adams. He had been a land commissioner. He was one of the midnight judges appointed by John Adams, and he was later appointed by Jefferson as the chief judge of the U.S. Circuit Court. He might also sound familiar to some people because Cranch was a reporter for the Supreme Court. So if you ever cite to to Cranch, that's the Cranch. But the other professor was William Thomas Carroll. And the Carrolls were well known in early America. His grandfather had been a senator from Maryland. The Carroll home uh, is still standing. It's known as the Dumbarton House on Q Street in Georgetown. His cousin had signed the Declaration of Independence. His father had helped usher Dolly Madison from the White House when it was set afire by the British in 1814. When she helped secure the portrait of George Washington, he got her to the Dumbarton House. The Carrolls were a very old family. William Carroll was born in 1802, and he then attended Mount St. Mary's College, and he then went on to the Litchfield Law School in 1823. So this brings us to the Litchfield Law School. In early America, the way that one became a lawyer was to read the law. You would go into an attorney's office and sort of be an apprentice to that attorney for a number of years, learning how to draft a contract or how to go into a courtroom and eventually pass a bar exam. There were no law school. Some states actually still have this as a way of becoming a lawyer. At any rate, in Connecticut, there was an attorney named Tapping Reeve. He was an attorney who started working with a few students And he decided to make this into a major enterprise. And he eventually began holding classes and even built a schoolhouse next to his house where he could conduct classes. This was the first proprietary law school in America. It ran from 1784 until 1833. For many years, it was thought to be the very first law school. They now think actually the law school at William and Mary was the first law school. But this is the first proprietary law school. And it is so important because the number of people that it graduated. It graduated vice presidents, including Aaron Burr, who was Reeves' brother-in-law, cabinet officers, Supreme Court justices, congressmen, governors, law school founders. In a way, the Litchfield Law School was a major force in the development of early American law. This was the law school that William Thomas Carroll went to, and then when he came to GW, that was the law that he was teaching to the first students here at GW. 
So how is law taught at Litchfield? I have a little pamphlet here about the law school at Litchfield. The law is divided into 48 titles, which embrace all its important branches, and he treats them in systematic detail. They comprehend the whole of his legal reading during his 30 years. The lectures, which are delivered every day, and which usually occupy an hour and a half, embrace every principle and rule falling under the several divisions of the different titles. Whenever the opinions upon any point are contradictory, the authorities in support of either doctrine are cited, and the arguments advanced by either side are presented in a clear and concise manner, together with the lecturer's own views of the question. These lectures, thus classified, are taken down in full by the students, and after being compared with each other, are generally transcribed in a more neat and legible hand. The remainder of the day is occupied in examining the authority cited in support of the several rules and in reading the most approved of authors upon those branches of the law, which are at times the subject of the lectures. These notes, thus written out, are, when complete, comprised in five large volumes, which constitute books of reference, the great advantage of which must be apparent to everyone of the slightest acquaintance with the comprehensive and abstruse science of the law. Then they had examinations every Saturday, and they also had moot courts, which the judge oversaw. That was what William Thomas Carroll went through, and that was how he taught law here at GW, along with Cranch. Unfortunately, that ceased after two years, in 1828, due to the lack of interest and lack of funding by the board. So they only taught here for those two years. And then William Thomas Carroll actually went on to become the clerk of the Supreme Court. And he served in that role until 1863. And he's known today as the clerk who bought the Bible that Lincoln was sworn in on. And he was actually close friends with the Lincolns. And Lincoln's son, Todd, was buried in the Carroll family burial vault when he died. Helen Newman then discovered in the library these 12 volumes. So there are nine volumes in very neat cursive writing. You can read it very clearly. There's a chapter on baron and farm, husband and wife, parent and child, contracts, master and servant, bailment, inns and innkeepers, law merchant, debt, action of slander, action of trover, action of assault and battery, action of replevin, action of trespass. He would read these out to the students and they would take notes. There was no Socratic method as we have now. You would just read your lectures out. How exciting was that? So there are these nine volumes of notes. Then there are two volumes of shorthand note, which he would have taken in class as a student and then later transcribed in these very neat notes. And those are very rare. Now they have notebooks uh, from Litchfield at uh, some other law school. Yale especially has a number of these because it's in Connecticut. But nobody else has copies of the shorthand books, probably because once students had transcribed their notes, they didn't need the shorthand anymore. But Carol kept his shorthand notes. You can't read them. They're just amazing to look at. And there's one book then that belonged to his brother, who was also a student at Litchfield. His brother went on to be a judge in New York and a congressman as well. So we have these 12 volumes. And sadly, if you were here, Nina, I couldn't even show them to you. Oh, no. Because we are part of a wonderful exercise. Yale has contacted the libraries around the country, including us, to digitize the Litchfield Law Books from all the law schools that own them and make them available on a website. So we have shipped our Litchfield Law Books off to Yale temporarily, and they are going to be part of this wonderful online collection so that anybody around the country will be able to look at William Thomas Carroll's Litchfield Notebooks and see what he learned at Litchfield and also what he was teaching here at GW when we started law school at GW. That seems like a great opportunity for further scholarship. Oh, yes. You know, because, uh, of course, in the past, anybody interested in these would have to come here. And we have had some people come here and compare them. But, you know, it's hard to then say, well, what did this person write about contracts and what did this person write about contracts? Because you don't have them next to each other. Now people will be able to compare notebook to notebook and see how they might have differed over the years. This can be a wonderful opportunity for research into teaching of law in early America, how lawyers were trained in early America. So I know that students can't come visit these particular notebooks in person right now. For students who are interested in doing something like that, whether in person or in a digital version, 
How can they engage with the special collections? I encourage them to contact me. They can stop by or they can send me an email. We have all kinds of things in the archives that might be of interest to people. Granted, in many cases, it helps to have some knowledge of a foreign language. We have one of the finest collections of early European law in the country, and indeed probably the best collection of early French law in the country. We have volumes that are held by no other law library in the country, in some cases the only copy in the world. We have the finest collection of early French customary law. We do also have a great collection of early German law. We have, for example, an amazing witchcraft trial collection. We have trials of the Knights Templar in manuscript form. We have French revolutionary trials. It's just a, an endless collection. And I'm delighted to give tours, maybe just even to whet people's appetite, to give them ideas of what they might want to write about. I encourage people to just drop me a note, and I'm happy to give them a tour of the rare book collection. Thank you so much. That sounds like a wonderful opportunity. Oh, it's been my pleasure to do it. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. That's our show for today. If you'd like to check out more podcast episodes featuring other GW faculty, staff, alumni, and students, visit nothingbutdicta.com or check out our YouTube page, Nothing But Dicta. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.